I'm Nick Turzo, and you are listening to The Radical. This week's guest is a brilliant guitarist, songwriter, and producer of a multi-platinum, chart-topping band. With legions of dedicated fans, this band has managed to keep its integrity through the past couple decades. AFI guitarist and songwriter Jade Puget joins me to discuss his creative process, AFI's newest record, Bodies, and this band's uncanny ability to stay relevant with their musical progression. Coming up, my conversation with Jade Puget. Jade, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, new record out called Bodies. Um, yes. Was released a couple months ago now. Yeah. Um, there's some incredible songs on here. It sounds you. remarkable. Um, you. so you do produce this record too, as, as long as and on top of writing, uh, tell me a little bit about the record. When did you record it? And, uh, how did you record it under the, I mean, how many of the like last records have you actually kind of sat in the producer chair? Well, going back to 2003 and our Sing the Sorrow record, I had a producer credit on that. And so I kind of been producing whether I'm credited or not, sort of like since then, I guess. And, but now I'm actually doing all the production. So for, for the last, I don't know, several years. Yeah. And do you bring occasional kind of collaborators in on that process to uh, just, if you're changing up sound or anything or not really, is it all just you're no, at the Yeah. I mean, not really in a control freak way. It's just, when I create, when I write the songs, I'm here in my studio and I'm crafting each thing sort of minutely. And it's just like, there's, it's a very solitary process. It's not really that there is a way to bring another person in, in this part of it. Right. That makes perfect sense. Um, was bodies recorded, were you guys able to do it in person prior to COVID or was it done during the pandemic somehow? We did it before the lockdown, but we did it sort of separately, which is like, you know, we're not one of those bands that gets in the room and jams. Um, we never have been, even in the early, early days. So we've always tracked our parts separate. So it really, you know, even pandemic-wise, it would lend itself to that process. Like Adam went in the studio, but Hunter did his bass at home, and I recorded the vocals in here and did all of the, the production in here. And yeah, so it was a very modular process that's awesome i mean in, i mean you guys as a tendency kind of work a little bit kind of in a cycle right or you stick to an album cycle is that how your world still kind of works for the band yeah for better or for worse i'm not really a fan of that model because you know i think davy especially really likes to be like okay we did the record now we're touring and there's no writing during that touring we're just doing this and then when we're done with that we're back to this it's very segmented and regimented, but you know, I, I've got to this point where I'm just writing all the time, which is, I think better because, you know, you don't want to stifle your process. Right. And I mean, in a normal process, I mean, do you find that you've kind of, I don't want to even use the word cause that's kind of a weird word, but I was going to say overwrite uh, for a record or is there just a plethora of music to choose from at that point? I am an inveterate overwriter. So like, you know, I, I just, I literally write every day. I'm in here for hours. And even if I didn't have to be, I would do it anyway, because I'm just really driven to write and I love it. And so it's not about trying to pump out as much as I can. It's just like, I love being in here writing music. So there's always going to be a lot of material. You know, and I think like in my humble opinion, um, you know, I think you guys are probably the last, um, kind of great, I don't want to use the word rock band. I'm just going to use the word band, um, kind of standing over the last 25 years. You know, I think Lincoln Park was somewhat of a contemporary, you know, but unfortunately with Chester passing. So, I mean, I feel like you guys hold the mantle as kind of like one of the last great bands. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. that. We've seen. Um, and on the record, I mean, do you, is, is this like with bodies, is that thematic or is that just simply we put together a bunch of different ideas and we like the variety of that. 
Yeah, it's this is something that has been recurrent with me and and pretty much all the projects that I do is it's this eclecticism, which you know that can really hurt you because you have a record, you know, like never mind. It's like obviously every song sounds like the you know, he has the same guitar tones in the same studio, the same drum sound. And that's a good thing because it, it has a cohesive feel to it. But for me, I just I have this sort of like creative ADD where I don't want to write. 12 of the same song and it's like i need to do a bunch of different stuff and it's more fun that way it's more creative it's more artistic for me at least and so our records always end up sounding like every song has its own identity so that can hurt and that can help um so i'm hoping it helps more than it hurts well i think in a world of kind of decoupled music which we live in now you know in the nineties, we kind of built those cohesive records, you know, I was an a and guy back then. So there was kind of a reason for it, but now it just feels like you can decouple everything anyway. Um, That's true. So I guess maybe it's less harmful in a way. I think, yeah, I think you're right because you know, the way people consume, they're going to probably consume one or two songs at a time. And in fact, you know, each song is kind of its own little world. So you can definitely get away with that more, which I'm happy about because I don't think that's going to change for me anytime soon. Right. And the thing I'm fascinated at, which I think you just excel at, um, and especially on this record, is the way you've placed Davey's vocals in these songs. There's a certain thing, the way you place his vocals, it's like really, really brilliant. And I, don't, I know you're kind of a little bit more of a melody guy, I think, uh, I hope anyway. I love melody guys, but it's interesting where his voice ends up in, in the mixes and the placement. It's perfect. I mean, you know, we've been writing together for 20 plus years. So I think it's just become this intuitive thing of, of how to work with each other. And I think he's learned a lot over the years of where he needs to be singing. Because, you know, when we, we first started, he would sing everything in like a high B which is, you know, a very high note. And he'd be screaming in this insanely high register, not realizing that's not really something you can sustain, especially when you get older. And so I think now he realizes, okay, I can't be like, sing up here, like Bruce Dickinson, you know, I need to be exploring my vocal range a little more. So we both have learned a lot about that. Yeah, well, you've mastered it clearly. Um, and I hear it on this record. It's total... It is. It's just total mastery. Um, Thank you. On the songs, I mean, you kind of have a variety. It's kind of interesting. You know, you have like, you know, the Tied to a Tree, which to me gives me a little bit of a Depeche Mode kind of vibe to it. And then you kind of have these songs like Far Too Near, which is awesome. Just beautiful. Almost a pop song. I mean, really beautiful. Uh, No Eyes is really a beautiful song. Um, The mix on here is just amazing to me. So do you have any... Uh, you, now in retrospect, are there songs that stick out to you as more favorite? Definitely Tied to a Tree has sort of been my favorite since we finished the record. And it's just something about that song. It, we did the video for it. And, you know, when you're doing a video, you have to listen to a song a hundred times or 200 times. And it never gets old to me. It always has that same emotional heft for me. And usually that's not always the case because when you write something, you're so in it that it doesn't affect you the same way as hearing someone else's song, but it really affects me almost like I'm hearing someone else's song. So that's kind of like definitely my favorite, I would say. Right. And is the video process still like as elaborate as it used to be? I mean, is it still, it's a necessary evil. Is it still, is it easier to do these days than it used to, was in the past? I mean, I hate making videos, but you know, I, I'm not complaining in a real way because I have a very dream job, but making videos is not my favorite, but you know, it depends. Cause now obviously the bu- budgets of yesteryear are not there anymore. So it's not as elaborate, but I got to say the tied to a tree video was pretty elaborate. That one um, we're making videos now, which is, we're pretty like commando gorilla videos where it's just like one guy, one camera, which I love because it's very quick and you can get great results. Like we did a Dulceria video, and that was, you know, one guy, one camera, but it turned out really cool. It's like, if you have the right idea and the right guy, I mean, you don't need 300 grand. Right. Well, the technology's definitely stepped up for sure. Um, it's too bad MTV on their 40th anniversary year wouldn't uh, go back to playing some of these videos. They really should. That would be the greatest know. celebration, you know? It's so many sad things that we've lost in the world of music, but I mean, I guess you can only look forward. Indeed. Um, do you record... Um, digitally or mostly in analog how do you kind of do your recording i'm not in the box i have outboard gear like you know 
obviously a mic and it goes through an outboard pre and a compressor. And then that's kind of like the analog chain and then everything else is in a box. Got it. Got it. Got it. And I mean, you're pretty much, I mean, you're known as the guitarist in this band, but I mean, I, you are a multi-instrumentalist, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, lo- I actually wrote several songs on this on the bass, starting with the bass. Um, and the way this technology is and the way my demoing process is now is my demos are so fully realized that they kind of sound like the record in a lot of ways, you know, but of course, Hunter and Adam do their own thing on it. But, you know, I give them this blueprint that, you know, I, I, I write the drums and the bass and write all the stuff and then let everyone kind of run with what they want to run with. Right. And do you do um, creatively as a songwriter and stuff, do you do any outside writing or do you kind of not since you kind of say that you're, kind of always in the writing mode is there ever material you say gee you know what it's not for us but boy i could see so and so recording this i have done outside writing and i've done writing sessions like professional writer sessions and they're just so soul destroying i hate it and i just don't want to do it anymore like it's not really worth it getting a song on some big record or something just to have to sit through those that's just not who i am as a songwriter it's just i hate it so i have done outside stuff and um i also write commercials sometimes like i've been doing that for many years just as like a side thing because it's kind of fun you know you're doing like basically a 30 second song and everyone is different like you might do hip-hop next one's country it's like so that's really fun so i do that and i've done a little scoring stuff but you know i have like i've been writing over the last year and a half starting when with the lockdown and stuff and i've written a ton of songs and i'm writing the all the melodies and even singing on the demos now because you know davy and i could get together so i I kind of did everything on these and some of them I do feel like, man, this would sound great if like the 1975 did it or something, but it's like, I don't want to go through the whole process of trying to get that song to the right people. It's just like, it just seems so daunting that I will never do it. Yeah. The pitching process is no fun, but no. you know, but I could definitely see you, you know, on the scoring side, you know what I mean? I'll, uh, you know, uh, Trent Reznor and stuff. I mean, going down that path, I mean, it seems it'd be kind of a natural for you. I do it if I got asked to do the right thing where it was like, you know, cause I have so many duties in this band and black audio, just those two things keep me so busy that to stop and do a movie would be a lot of work and it'd have to be something that I was really excited about. Yes, indeed. Indeed. And I mean, with black audio and stuff, I mean, do you find that, I mean, does that allow you the ability to experiment? I mean, do you take stuff back from that and bring it to a- AFI or is it just, you keep the world separate. Now it goes both ways and it always has like, you know, we had a song, one of our biggest songs ever love like winter that was on December underground. And that started as a black audio song. And then we, I just decided like, Hey, this could be AFI. And then, you know, that was a big song for us. So on this, on bodies, um, back from the flesh was a song that I always envisioned being a black audio song. It just reminds me of Depeche mode. And I'm like, this is so obviously a black audio song, but then I'm like, it would all, it would be cool to be an AFI song because it would be more unexpected. It's kind of expected that it's black audio, but like so, you know, that could have went either way. Right. And I mean, since you're such a prolific writer, I mean, like how do you um kind of track what you've done then? I mean, if you kind of come up with, you know, scale and quantity, and how do you ever refer back to what you've may have started? I have I not may not remember many things, but I have an encyclopedic recall of my own material and so i have all these things you know i'm usually working on 10 to 20 things at the same time because you know rather than just focus on one thing and finish it i'll go back so you get some perspective a little objectivity if you go away from something for even for a day you come back to it so you know i'm constantly jumping around and working on pieces of this and pieces of that so like i have all these things i know kind of where everything is and where like Oh yeah, that song that I worked on like five years ago, that would be like good for this, you know? So I do have some recall of it. Right. And do you have any kind of creative rituals? I mean, is this stuff just always kind of living in your head at this point? Um, Are there actually like some, is there discipline and rituals you need to follow? I think, you know, people would probably say it's the antithesis of creativity to have this kind of rigid framework for your process. But for me, just it's kind of like, I think like authors are the same way. It's like, just, you have to have this period of time where you sit down and you do the work, even if you don't feel it, you get into it. And so like, 
I am, I'm a very morning person, so I'm very creative in the morning, which I don't think is very common for, for mu musicians, you know, like to me, the thought of sitting in here writing at 2 a.m. is insane. Like I would never do that. But in the morning, like, so I, I'm in here first thing in the morning writing like every day. And that's part of the process, just doing it. Because even if you don't feel like it, you never know something great could come out. Another thing I find important is at the end of each day, like in the evening, I'll take a walk and listen to everything I've done that day. And even if you've stepped away for an hour, like you listen to something you did earlier that afternoon, you have this weird like objectivity where you're like, oh, this is terrible. Like, I thought this was so good when I was doing it or like, wow, that part is actually really cool. And I could expand on that. So that process is important. Taking at the end of the day, review your stuff and see where you're at. Right. And back to the, the uh, you know, the process of making an album. I mean, is the sequencing of songs that important anymore now that we talked earlier of the decoupling and how people listen differently? Or is that important to you as an artist? I'm sure that it has lost some importance, but to me, I will never see it as anything but super crucial. And so sequencing, I love sequencing. And, you know, I write the set list when we play live and like, I'm very cognizant and aware of the dynamic of a set list, which is, you know, kind of like a small version of a album sequence. So the dynamics of a song, the flow of it, um, I'm very interested in that. And I think it's very, very important to me, at least as a songwriter and a band member. Right. And on the set list part and trying to present this live, I mean, is that more of a challenge as you run into 25 years of work or, I mean, how do you, how do you edit and curate that? I mean, I don't find it difficult. I think that like, you know, different people in the band might have a different, like, I think Davey is like when we play something, from a record that was 30 years ago. And then the next thing is from bodies. He like, thinks that's a lot more jarring, um, which I understand because he's singing and I'm playing, but to me, I like, you know, I go off crowd reaction. So if the crowd is reacting great to this and they're reacting great to that, why not have them together? And the crowd doesn't seem to mind. They just were like, Oh, that song, this song. Awesome. Like I want to hear both those songs. So that's all that matters. If the crowd is having a good time, that's what you're there for. Right. And is there a, any pressure in the world of social media nowadays that, you know, each set has to be different? Do you feel that or do you get feedback on that or does that you just ignore that? I did ignore it. Ten so or so years ago, I didn't realize it at the time, because before you could go and play the same set in every city and people didn't really know unless they were coming to multiple shows. But now someone might look at the set you're playing if you're playing, because a lot of bands do play the same set or very close to the same set. And you look at the set and they're like, they're not playing songs for my favorite album. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to spend 30 or 40 bucks to go see the set that I'm not into. So you, it is something that can affect your attendance now, which is interesting. But we really like to change our set a lot. And it's just fun to change our set constantly. So I think our fans know you're always going to get, and we have fans that come to like 10 shows in a row. So they don't want to see the same set. And that would embarrass me to see that guy that I've seen in five shows in a row and know that we're playing him the same songs and he drove like 10 hours. Right. And your fans are dedicated, let's just say, right? That's an understatement. They are. They're, they're great. Which is awesome. It's awesome. It is. And so, so, I mean, you know, having done this now for almost a quarter of a century with this band, um, I mean, what is the, your perspective, um, you know, kind of as a band, as a writer, um, you know, when you're kind of, your life is in a different place it was when you were in your 20s. How does that affect you thematically or kind of stylistically? Or, or does it, or does it not? I mean, it certainly affects you stylistically. I, I don't think there's any band or very few bands that can say that, what they're into now is exactly the same as it was or what they want to write. It's like, you know, obviously 20 some odd years ago, we were playing fast punk and hardcore. That's what we wanted to write. We would never conceive of writing a record like bodies, but you know, if I was, you know, us being in our forties now, if we wrote, if we were still writing fast punk hardcore songs, it would just be, I'm sure there's some, a lot of fans that would like that, but I don't know if they would like it. You, you know, you think you want your, the band to stay the same, your favorite band, but do you really want that? Because I feel like you would realize even subconsciously that's a cop out and it's not, you're just, you would just be pandering and I never want to pander and I don't want to, it's just soul destroying to repeat yourself over and over. And so like, like a shark, I feel like you got to keep swimming. You got to keep moving ahead. Can't go backwards. You have to, even if you fail, 
you have to fail moving forward. Makes perfect sense. Um, who are some of like your kind of earlier influences that kind of tipped you into, you know, music or being passionate about music? I mean, if we're talking about passionate about music, I mean, that would obviously be the earliest discovery of music. And I did this thing where I was picking like early stuff that inspired me and like, you know, hearing early, early, like the Beatles, Michael Jackson, Prince, Motown, stuff like that from my mom. And she was also a classical composer and pianist and hearing a lot of classical from the very earliest sitting and listening to my mom play classical pieces on the piano. Like, so all that stuff really affected me. And I remember like hearing Vivaldi was the first time as a really young kid having an emotional response to music and feeling something from the music. Like it's making me feel something. It's not just these sounds. So like that would probably be the earliest. And then, you know, discovering punk was obviously a big milestone for me because that sent me on the path sort of that I'm at now and, you know, discovering all the great punk bands of the eighties. And, and also I love the blues when I started playing guitar, like Robert Johnson and BB King, like these are things that I would throw on, even though I was primarily in punk bands and listening to punk music, I would put on BB King and just play my guitar to BB King. I only knew one scale. And so that was something that I really loved. That's awesome. Yeah. I thought I'd read something too, where you, you kind of mentioned a uh, men at work record, which I thought, you know, yes, I have Colin Hay on this week on the podcast. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I love Colin Hay. I mean, that first men at work record, I got that for Christmas when I was like seven or something. And that was really the first time that I was like imagining my, I thought I was a a sax player. Like I imagined myself playing the sax because sax was so cool in the eighties. So I didn't even imagine myself as like, I wasn't doing like some air guitar. It was like air sax, but like that record and that record today still is every song stands up. That's an amazing record. And it certainly gets attention, but I think that record should get more attention for being just such a masterpiece. Well, it's definitely a defined sound, right? It's the, it was their own. It is their own. It's still their own. When you listen to it, it's that's, yeah, that's an amazing accomplishment. So it is, but even besides that, the songwriting on it is so incredible. I mean, yeah, I love that record. Yeah, that's awesome. Did your mom then being classically trained, did she kind of insist on that with you? I mean, is it when you were younger or not? No, I mean, we were really poor. So the thought of even lessons was definitely not even in the, not even a possibility, but she taught me how to play some stuff. And I've never taken a lesson in my life. I can't read music. Like I have, I don't know theory. I don't know any of this stuff. Like I'm totally self-taught. So, you know, I'm kind of glad it happened that way because everything that I do is kind of from me and my own, making my own mistakes and figuring it out rather than, you know, learning how to do it from other people. Right. Well, you've excelled quite well. So something's in your DNA um, that came from that side of the family. So, yeah. So you guys have touring plans in 2022. You pushed off until next year, which is probably wise based on the current situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, a couple months ago, I was starting to get some FOMO because I'm seeing everyone planning tours for 2021. I'm like, oh man, should we have like pushed it off so far? And now it's feeling like maybe that was the right move. Yeah. When's the last tour cycle you guys did? It would have been Smashing Pumpkins um, of 2019 tour. So it's been a minute. And the last headlining tour, which is insane, was the beginning of 2017. We have not headlined in the U.S. for, it will have been five years, which is like, I can't even, that's never happened in the history of AFI. Wow. I mean, did that work for you guys as like a package with the pumpkins? I mean, for me, that totally works. I would have been, I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, yeah, you know, you know, it's funny. We've done these big tours before and as a support act. And it's usually like you're playing in that late afternoon <clears throat> in a shed. And it's like people are kind of filtering in and some people are paying attention. It's not always the best experience, but this one was like really cool. And, and we got, our, people were open to what we were doing. And it was nice to see, like, I was actually pretty excited about this and the pumpkins are great. They're all cool guys. Got to see the Smashing Pumpkins every night, which is awesome. So I I really enjoyed that tour. Right. When you do tours, do you necessarily have opening acts when you headline or do you kind of take the night for yourselves? No, we always have opening acts because it's weird. It's weird for us 
if we were the only band, it's like, it feels like you're not giving the fans like a, a whole experience. Plus we're not a band like Springsteen. We don't play like four hours, you know, we play like an hour and a half tops. So, I mean, for people to pay and to come to a venue for an hour and a half is like, that'd be a little weird too. Yeah. I just felt like your fans are so fanatical that I, I, I would definitely think they would be all about you guys. I would hate to be the opening act. So, I mean, we have had some opening acts in the past that I felt very bad for, you know, like we, we went out with the blood brothers in the mid two thousands and they're a really cool band. And, and I just don't think that like I, some of our fans were, were really getting into their sound. And so I felt bad because I thought they were really cool. Okay. Awesome. So is touring really what's next for you period? I mean, is there some other recording you're doing in the future or right now while you're waiting? Um, Dave and I are actually working on a new black audio record uh, right now. And I've written a bunch of AFI songs I'm super excited about. Um, and so I actually just showed everyone the songs yesterday for the first time. Like no one had heard a single note. And so like, you know, I haven't even heard back what they think about them yet. So I like, you know, sitting here in anticipation of like, are they going to like them? Or are they going to like be like, no. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, you're clearly like a driving force now. When you first came into the band, right, where they were already a band, so to speak, and already done a few records. I mean, how did you kind of ease your way into this, I guess, as a way as a creator and a songwriter? I mean, I was kind of, I didn't really ease my way in. I was kind of thrown in because the day that Davey asked me to join, we sat down and started writing Black Sails. Like, so we wrote songs that day. So I was a little trepidatious because I was like, this band already exists. This is like a band that has a following. And like, if I'm writing songs, I could totally screw this band up because like the main songwriter had left. I, that's a guy that I replaced. So like I could send this band on this path that would just like fail for all of us. And luckily that didn't happen. But yeah, I was really thrown right in the deep end as the main songwriter. Right. How are you introduced? I mean, did you guys know each other from the same geographic area? Or? Yeah, me and Adam and... Dave all grew up in the same town. And so I had known them for, you know, years already. Wow. Well, it worked. And your, your added addition has really taken them to a whole different level. It's your songwriting is really incredible. Thank so, you. Appreciate that. Um, everyone new records called bodies um, by AFI. It's out. It was out in June. I highly recommend you listen. It's really one of the great, band records in a long time so well, thank you that's very kind my pleasure jade thank you for your time i really appreciate it stay healthy and uh you too. i look forward to seeing you guys um, on the road awesome thank you thank you thank you for listening this show originates from the podcast capital austin texas my producer is sean o'neill Visit theradicalpot.com for updates and even some merchandise. Also, please subscribe at Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And I also ask that you please share episodes with your friends so we can continue to grow our community. See you all again next Friday.